Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Exports to the EU of British goods like seafood and dairy products fell by just over 40% in January after the Brexit transition period came to an end. Imports also fell by nearly 30%. The Office for National Statistics says temporary factors, like producers stockpiling goods before the end of the year, were to blame. At the same time, the British economy shrank by 2.9 per cent, largely because of Covid restrictions. Our economics correspondent Andy Verity has more. This Manchester exporter of branded clothing, much of it for corporate events that haven't been happening, has got through what it describes as a nightmare year, just staying in business and keeping staff safe. But now, its boss told me, Far from the promised frictionless trade, it's become very difficult to export to Europe. Transporters and couriers are charging big extra fees to cover much more complex paperwork and taxes, pushing costs up so high it's had to stop exporting to European consumers. We had one order which was a £15 order. The customer contacted us because they were contacted by the, uh, the post office to say that there were €38 Euros of admin charges to pay in order to collect that order. We've tried to deal with it by paying on behalf of the customer. We've taken on the, the complexity of that. Uh, but the cost and the time and the admin just means it's not viable to ship those orders into Europe anymore. Overall, exports of goods to the EU dropped by 40.7%, the biggest fall on record. By far the hardest hit were exporters of food and live animals, with dairy down 50%, meat exports down 59%, and fish and shellfish exports down by 83%. We are working very closely with the EU. It's in everybody's interest that trade is as smooth as possible. We were always clear there would be extra processes that would need to be undertaken. Uh, and I'm confident that we will continue to build exports to the EU as well as exports to the rest of the world. While the economy is officially forecast to roar into action next year, growing by 7%, Businesses like Goodwood still have months to get through with very little money coming in. Now we know over the next few years we've got to get back to where we were two years ago, but that's not going to take another couple of years. After the economy was brought screeching to a halt by the lockdown last spring, it picked up speed in the summer and autumn, only to have the government slam the brakes on again after Christmas, leading to a 2.9% drop in activity in January. While the Office for National Statistics said much of the hit to trade was probably temporary as businesses adjust to the new regime, just weeks after the Brexit transition ended, it's still too soon to tell how much of that economic damage might be more lasting. Andy Verity, BBC News. Welcome back. There was a double dose of bad economic news for the UK today. New figures show the economy shrank by 2.9% in January as lockdown restrictions came into force. And in the same month, UK exports in the EU fell by over 40%, a value of £5.6 billion. Our Europe editor James Mates reports from Athens on what the impact could be. They may not be haute cuisine, not even to every European's taste, but these traditional products at the British store in Athens have found a good market among expats, holidaymakers and Anglophile Greeks. But it's an export market in deep trouble since the beginning of the year. Oppressive paperwork, health checks on fresh meat or dairy, delays at customs, tariffs on some goods made outside the UK. But George Miaoulis, a Greek raised in Scotland, Business survival is likely to mean cutting links with Britain. It's a total, total nightmare. It's a disaster. It will survive because they found other ways to get around it. And it's basically making Britain poorer and it's making other countries richer because all I do is uh, I'll find another way of getting them from other countries that have the same products. And uh, that's costing Britain money. And it's not just me, it's thousands of other businesses in Europe that are doing exactly the same thing. But these high-profile, high-visibility products are just the tip of a very large iceberg. Most British exports to Greece are much less well-known from companies you often haven't heard of. And yet they are suffering exactly the same problems with customs, paperwork, delays. We visited Fashion Loft, a wholesaler in central Athens that imports and distributes clothes from across Europe. They buy from UK fashion design company Traffic People and had been looking to expand their business with the UK. That's now on hold. 12% tariffs to pay if, as most are, the clothes are made in Asia. The cost of customs clearance and of storage if clearance is slow. All VAT to be paid in advance. None of this happened before January the 1st. We had to pay 40% more 
uh, in advance because of the extra costs. Uh, our uh, financial advisors uh, advise us to stop with UK brands because this is not uh, uh, affordable. Martina says she won't do that yet while she waits to see if things improve. But the decision she must make is similar to that being made by thousands of companies who have bought British goods, want to continue buying British goods, but no longer know if it makes financial sense. James Mates, ITV News, Athens. Now, the Office for National Statistics said that in January, exports of goods from the UK to the EU dropped by a staggering 40%. The government said that lockdowns, stockpiling and businesses adjusting to new trading relationships make reductions inevitable. But as our economics correspondent Helia Ebrahimi now explains, it is a figure that is causing deep alarm amongst businesses. Friction is emerging between the Prime Minister and his European counterparts. In the first trade figures released since Brexit, it was goodbye Europe and goodbye 40% of our exports, with imports from the EU also slipping 28%, both record declines, at a time when lockdown saw 2.9% knocked off the economy. Sir Howard Davies, a man who's been at the top of the Bank of England, the LSE, and is now chairman of NatWest, says he's worried what these numbers say about the UK's financial future. I am rather anxious about the trade figures. The question really is whether that's temporary to do with disruptions and people stockpiling before the change, etc., or does it reflect a fact that people are changing their supply chains? if there has been permanent damage to trade. If that's the case, that's quite serious. With COVID hitting consumer businesses and Brexit hitting exporters, two vital parts of the economy are being squeezed at the same time. We have been more affected by this combination of COVID and Brexit, which is, a, which is an unpleasant combination. We are one of the most affected countries in terms of how bad a hit it's been. And then we have on top of that, Brexit, which has created, as we can see from today's figures, a lot of uncertainty and nervousness. Today's data shows that trade with non-EU countries rose only 1.7 percent, just £200 million, a paltry figure when put against the millions of containers making their way back and forth across the channel. This week, the Institute of Directors said small UK companies felt so frustrated by the friction caused by border checks that one in five businesses have stopped trading with Europe altogether. But it's not just goods. In the city, they've seen 7,000 jobs disappear and Amsterdam take over as Europe's biggest hub for share trading. There is a trend and there's no doubt that being outside the single financial market will impose a cost. The financial sector pays an awful lot of tax. It pays about £75 billion pounds of tax, you know, which is over 10% of um, revenues. And that is a very significant prize. And if that were a halve, say, you know, that would be a huge hole in the government's finances. That lucrative tax take is what's led European leaders to do an interesting vault fast on their attitude to bankers. The French are making a big push. It's not so long ago that President Hollande said, my enemy is finance. Uh, and now they are talking about rolling out a red, white and blue carpet for bankers coming back from London. What we forget, I think, is that during the period of the single financial market, London became the absolute centre of finance in, the, uh, in Europe. That's gone now, though, isn't it? That's over. We shouldn't kid ourselves. They are going to try very hard to pull this activity back. The government argues today's figures show just a temporary effect and that they're looking at ways of keeping the city competitive, including some controversial loosening of regulations. It's a difficult balance because you don't want a free-for-all market um, removing all regulations, saying everything goes, let's have a party because that didn't end terribly well the last time. So you have to establish a balance between decent regulation and a bit more flexibility. That's possible because some of the European rules are not terribly good. The city's role at the heart of European finance produced growth, money and jobs for this country, something the Chancellor may miss as he tries to repair the public finances.
Well, one of the most high-profile post-Brexit trade problems has been with goods going from Britain to Northern Ireland. Unionists are furious that under the Northern Ireland Protocol, they're subject to EU customs checks. On a visit there today, Boris Johnson defended his decision to unilaterally delay the introduction of full checks for another six months. The EU have threatened legal action, but the Prime Minister insisted his actions were lawful. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, reports from Belfast. Number 10 said the Prime Minister's trip here was focused on COVID. But they know the protocol is what people want to ask him about. So the usual local TV interviews didn't happen. He spoke only briefly on camera about why the government had unilaterally broken the agreement with the EU and decided to delay the introduction of more checks on goods coming into Northern Ireland from Britain. What we want to ensure is that the protocol upholds the uh, wishes of all communities, of both communities, and, uh, and has the consent of, of both. So there's got to be an east-west uh, consent to what's going on, as well as, as north-south. So that's what we're doing. We're just trying to make sure that uh, that's built into it. Menacing graffiti and protest posters have sprung up around Northern Ireland, objecting to products being checked on their way in from Britain, or even in some cases, barred. Northern Ireland's First Minister Arlene Foster has hardened her stance against the protocol. And before touring the vaccination centre in her constituency, she lobbied the Prime Minister in private. In terms of the protocol, we will continue to put across the view of the majority of people living here in Northern Ireland that it is very important that it is dealt with in a meaningful way and that it is replaced because it is causing untold damage, not just to unionists, but to people right across uh, Northern Ireland in terms of the integrated supply that we have from the rest of the United Kingdom. Sinn Féin complained they'd been denied a similar political meeting. That's not my information, but I'm always happy to, to meet all sides. Many here want all the new checks in operation at points of entry like the Port of Larne abandoned. But the EU is pressurising the UK to double down on checks. Letters from Brussels threatening legal action for not doing this are expected any minute. Some EU capitals are already talking about how they might be able to retaliate against Britain on other fronts for pausing these checks. The British government is briefing that these aren't pauses in the sense that they're to allow business to prepare for the checks. They're about allowing a rewrite of the whole policy. The two sides seem far apart in the first great prolonged spat of the post-Brexit era. Gary Gibbon, Channel 4 News, Belfast. Well, let's talk now to Sir Simon Fraser, a former permanent undersecretary at the Foreign Office who also worked at the European Commission on Trade Matters, and David O'Sullivan, an Irish diplomat who served as the EU's ambassador to the United States. Welcome to you both. Let me start with you, Sir Simon. Michael Gove once upon a time famously said that the British public had had enough of experts. It looks like they've now had enough of exports. Now, when the government says these are just teething problems, do you believe them? Uh, well, partly, I guess. But, I mean, look, nobody is surprised, I think, that there's been a fall in exports to the EU that, that, in January because it was the first month after the end of the so-called transition period uh, when we had left the single market and left the customs union, and it was bound to happen. But I think what is surprising, indeed shocking, is the scale of that fall. So 40% of the UK's exports to the EU uh, uh, compared with the January a year ago. Now, if you bear in mind that our export, our trade with the EU is about 45% of our total global trade, you're talking of a figure of almost 20% of our total exports to world markets falling in January. And that is a very large figure. So that is surprising. But I do agree with people who say we shouldn't jump too rapidly to conclusions because the, the pandemic factor is clearly you know, an important, you know, extra issue, which has depressed activity. Mm -hmm. There was stockpiling before the end of the transition period, and there are these teething troubles. So, you know, not the whole of that is a structural Brexit effect, but some of it certainly is. David O'Sullivan, we just heard there from Gary Gibbon that, you know, there are massive issues in Northern Ireland regarding the Northern Ireland Protocol. Ireland itself, the Republic, is very badly affected by this decline in exports and imports. You're having to fight this battle on two fronts, really, aren't you? How long can you go on with this? 
Well, I, I think with regard to the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, the, 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 the view in the EU and, and in Ireland is that this was negotiated almost personally by the British Prime Minister. Uh, I recall it was almost just described as a negotiating triumph. It was signed by the British government. It was ratified by the British Parliament. Uh, and so people don't quite understand why people are now saying, well, this isn't working. Uh, because if, if it isn't working, did people either not understand what they were signing or did they sign it in bad faith? So I think that's the first point that has to be said. This was the only solution that could be found to a very difficult problem that Brexit posed, a fundamental challenge to the issue, the position of Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement, peace on the island of Ireland. Now, this was it was not a perfect solution. I don't think anyone thought it was, but it was felt to be the only one. And the trick is to make it work. And that requires both sides to address any issues which arise. We were in the middle of negotiating uh, the kinds of issues that are now being discussed when the British government unilaterally decided uh, to take action, which is deeply unhelpful. Right, but is the European Union now dragging its feet you know, on some crucial issues like data and financial regulation, and perhaps while they're dragging their feet, uh, making a bit of a land grab for some of the business from London? No, the European okay. Union is not its feet. The, the UK has now become a third country. That means that different rules apply to it than applied when it was a full member. Uh, the European Union has to give approval for data transfers, has to eventually decide on issues like uh, equivalence for financial services. These things take time. Uh, they need to be studied. We are treating the United Kingdom in the same way that we treat any other third country which is not a member of the European Union. OK, uh, Simon, uh, Lord Frost is now in charge. He's, you know, got, uh, he's quite robust in his views. You know, he wrote a piece in the Daily Telegraph the other day, kind of pointing the finger at Brussels for being too difficult. Has he made the bad blood even worse? Well, I think that David Frost, you know, who's one of the architects of the agreement that we have, he's one of the architects of the hard Brexit that we have uh, and the consequences of it. Uh, but on the other hand, he did negotiate those agreements and he does know the people in Brussels. I think he's representing the views of this government, which are they don't like him a very pro Brexit much. government. Sorry? Sorry? They don't like him very much in Brussels, apparently. Well, I'm not sure that his job is to be there to be liked. I think his job is to, is to be there to, uh, con to represent the British government's view. Now, whether or not you agree with the British government's view, he does represent it. I do think that, however, he and others in the British government need to think about the political relationship and atmosphere that is developing between the UK and the EU, because it's not positive at the moment. And if we're going to deal with this structural change in trade, for example, and if we want to you know, keep as much trade as we can with Europe, then we do need to focus on trying to have a positive political relationship as we come out of this Brexit negotiation with all the, you know, all the, not, not ill will, but the negatives that have associated with it. OK, David O'Sullivan, finally, is there something that the European Union should be doing that it's not doing in order to kind of improve the tone here? Or are we just going to settle down to the kind of long-standing, rumbling conflict of attrition? Well, that is certainly a risk. I mean, I, I genuinely think that the European Union has tried not to uh, escalate this, has tried to, to stay calm. Uh, people were deeply disappointed that the unilateral decision to, uh, uh, to extend the, the, the grace periods at a moment when precisely people were sitting around a table trying to discuss that very issue and find a mutually acceptable solution. I think the European Union will remain open to a reasonable discussion. Uh, we also believe that post-Brexit we need to establish the most cooperative relationship possible with the, with the UK. But, mm. you know, this cannot happen if we have megaphone diplomacy which seems to want to attack and criticise the European Union at every possible moment. That, that will have to stop. OK. All right. Got to leave it there. David O'Sullivan, Sir Simon Fraser, thank you very much indeed to both of you. Jackie. The EU was, before Brexit, and is still expected to be our biggest trading partner. But a record drop in that trade of 40.7% in exports in January, the largest decline since comparable records began in 1997, looks like more than a little snagging. The government explained the sharp trading deficit as a unique combination of factors, including stockpiling last year, COVID lockdowns across Europe, and business adjusting to our new trading relationship. But if all these factors were in play, why did our trade for the same period with non-EU countries 
hold up so much better. And if the problem is Brexit controls, does our increasingly fraught relationship with the EU suggest it's a problem that's not going to be easily solved? Here's our diplomatic editor, Mark Urban. For a thousand years, British merchant ships have sailed the seas, extending British trade horizons and British power throughout Imports the Imports have long fueled the British economy, even if a generation or two ago it was a global, imperial free trade area that provided them. And just as the emergence of post-imperial trade produced dislocation and change, now the post-Brexit regime is producing its own consequences. It's a one-month change and it's quite significant and you can actually pinpoint it to, it's not as if you can reduce the um, impact of the goods trade change with what's happened in December, for example, when the border closed with France. So it's quite significant. The question is, is how permanent is it? UK exports to the EU fell in January by 41% and imports from the EU by 29%. The big gap between those figures is explained in large part by the waiving of checks on goods coming into Britain, while the EU has applied the rules. Trade with the rest of the world fell by 8% for exports and imports by 9 So that gives an idea of the Covid effect, but even taking that and pre-Brexit stockpiling into account, it's a big drop with the EU. How does that work in practice? Time to visit the cheese shop. Come on, I'll just have that little bit on top of it, yeah. and then we'll try that one. And... Neil's Yard built its business on high-quality UK cheeses. Its attempts to continue exporting to European customers post-Brexit have proven challenging. From the 1st of January to the end of January, we didn't, ex we didn't export a gram of cheese. <laughs> That's how complicated it was. And, ex the, and Europe is our fastest growing, has been our fastest growing export market. But we made a couple of attempts to export to Europe, to Paris. Um, in the second half of January and uh, it was very, very difficult and there was very long delays um, uh, and we had an aborted attempt um, which, uh, you know, where the truck was forced to return. So, yeah, it's been difficult. With every shipment it becomes maybe slightly easier but the delays have been very, very long. The government's response to today's figures has been to emphasise exceptional circumstances. We are working very closely with the EU. It's in everybody's interest that trade is as smooth as possible. We were always clear there would be extra processes that would need to be undertaken. Uh, and I'm confident that we will continue to build exports to the EU as well as exports to the rest of the world. Inevitably, some exports are harder hit, with clothes down 68% and footwear 73%. As for those sectors where new trade rules will make long-term recovery harder, food and live animal exports to the EU are down 54% overall, with fish and shellfish down from £92 million last January to 16 this one, live animals from £22 million to £6 million, and cheese down by two-thirds. And just as the evolution of ports and the loss of empire trade put the Thames bargees and warehousemen out of business, so the new regime of trade with Europe will create change. As the patterns of trade shift in the coming years, the biggest losers are likely to be in sectors like food and livestock export. They've got to deal with the full range of regulations, health, customs and the increased haulage costs, all of which will have to be passed on to customers with a likely impact on their export market. <laughs> How great a weight will the new EU trading regime put on exporters like this cheese business? The boss is quite candid about its impact. A double digit increase in price uh, it, it will have more than, you know, a 10% increase in price will have probably a 30% increase or impact on in decreasing our sales. There will be new markets and new opportunities, no doubt. Today's businesses will have to repeat the country's earlier feat of restructuring, but this time in a post-Brexit, post-pandemic world. Mark Urban, well, we invited the government onto the programme tonight, but they declined. I am joined by the Shadow International Trade Secretary, Emily Thornbury, 
Bloomberg's Stephanie Flanders and former Conservative Trade Minister and current member of the International Trade Select Committee, Mark Garney. Good evening to you all. If I could bring with you Mark Garney, begin. Centre for European Reform reckons about half the reduction in trade isn't COVID, it isn't stockpiling, but different trading regimes. Do you accept that that is a much more intractable problem? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think if you're a, a, an exporter who's exporting small quantities, so, so relatively low value uh, of good, uh, packets of goods, then your cost of exporting has now gone up very, very significantly compared with the, with the value of, the, of what you're exporting. But I think, uh, you know, until we've seen this really bed down over the next sort of coming months or even years, we won't really know the exact yes. effect uh, how, how this has had on... But on, on well, when you talk about coming months and coming years, the problem is that some of the agriculture, livestock and fishing industry doesn't have years to wait. There's a massive drop, you know, 92 million to 16 million in uh, food exports. That isn't something that, if it's not solved within a few months, then businesses will go under. Exactly right. And this is why we need, uh, we need this deal ratified properly by the European uh, Parliament. Uh, and we need to move on with this. But as I say, you know, I, I'm prepared at this, this stage to give the benefit of the doubt to the government in terms of the fact that there are teething problems with this. But you're absolutely right, Kirsty. You know, we, 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 we want to continue to trade uh, with the European Union and sanitary and phytosanitary products are very important for us. But if you, we, you heard there from the cheesemaker from Neil's Yard, and he was saying um, that 10% uh, has been added because of the cost of red tape. Yeah. Uh, but the increase in cost of business is two or three times that, 30%. I mean, that is unsustainable. Yes, exactly. And, 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 and if we don't move forward and we don't learn how to use these systems and we don't improve these systems, then it is, of course, going to be unsustainable. And only the very high value uh, exports yeah. are going to be the ones that are going to going to continue. The other thing, Kirsty, that I would say is that we need to also be looking at uh, exports and services, and particularly mm -hmm. financial services, where we're seeing a lot of uh, banks and financial services institutions setting up in the European Union. Um, and it would be interesting to see, and it would be very interesting what Stephanie Flums has to say about this, but what happens in terms of how we account for that in, in terms of our exports. Yes, but of course we do need live businesses actually working in uh, all the different countries of the United Kingdom. Emily Thornbury coming to you, uh, Lord Frost, the Minister of State for the Cabinet and also the ONS have blamed stockpiling and COVID because what they're saying is that overall freight volumes between the UK and the EU are back to normal levels now for over a month, suggests that it is just teething problems. Well, I've um, I've written today to one of the trade ministers about those that, about those stats which they're using, which I do think are very um, are not reliable. But let's say even if it is, even if there are the same amount of lorries going backwards and forwards, which I don't think there are, um, you know, it's, it's what's in the lorries which is important. Are they coming in uh, full and going out empty? Are they coming in half full and get what is it that's, that's in them? Counting the number of lorries in and off off row row um, ferries is not necessarily enough by itself. I think, I mean, I think there's certainly some of those, some of the problems are transitory. Some of the problems, you know, we can't say just because that we had these terrible results in January that that is going to continue. But I think there are three problems. One is that it, some of the problems are a fundamental consequence of the decisions that we made about the sort of Brexit that we wanted. So coming out of the customs union, coming out of the single market does mean there will be barriers to trade that aren't just tariffs. Um, I think the second thing is, is that the deal itself has failed to address a number of issues, which, you know, as we've heard, you know, certainly in terms of food, um, mm. agricultural produce um, and so on, you know, we seem to have a worse regime than the New Zealanders do when it comes to, to exporting into Europe. And, and, and we have talked, you know, we haven't talked about, about services and obviously our economy fundamentally is a services economy and there's nothing next to nothing in the deal which helps to smooth the way for services. And the third thing is a lack of time and preparation. I mean, getting a deal on Christmas Eve or whenever it was, um, when we don't have enough vets, we don't have enough customs agents, you know, and businesses simply haven't had enough time so, to prepare. So, so Emily Thornby, do you now regret voting for the deal? Do you think that was a mistake in December? Listen, we lost the general election. And when we lost the general election, we lost the argument mm -hmm. on staying in the European Union. And it, we had to move on. So that was the decision that was made. You know, there was the, there was the Brexit vote, there was the general election. We now, what we now have to do, I'm a pragmatic politician. What I want is the very best deal that we can have now with the European Union, with our closest neighbours, with whom we will always do the bulk of our trade. Well, let's come on to talking about financial services in a minute, uh, Stephanie Flanders. But first of all, how 
serious do you think this is? Um, you know, all, all the barriers to trade, or whether they're transitory or not, are affecting particularly in the agricultural business and uh, fishing business who don't have a lot of time. No, and you can see some extraordinary numbers in these in these figures. And as, as Mark Urban pointed out, for, for the shellfish and uh, things like that, which are down more than 80 percent, um, there's not much prospect that it's going to get a lot better unless you have a new kind of arrangement, a new kind of deal uh, with Europe, at least on, on that. Um, but it is a bit extraordinary. I mean, the, the, Mark Garnier has just given a much more kind of straightforward uh, acceptance of quite how much the difference this has made the red tape, particularly for small scale exporters, than any minister I've heard. Uh, I mean, it just, it was it was very much, as Emily Thornberry says, a, an element of this deal uh, that it was going to impose these kind of costs. And it's true that, I mean, if the numbers continue to be as bad as January, that would be yeah. an extraordinary impact and not one that we're expecting. But to have so little conversation around, you know, what the positive plan is, whether it's for services uh, or for anything else, does seem to me very odd. And to have the, the junking of an industrial strategy, which had been developed over three years, just to, with a sort of stroke of a pen in the budget last week. But, yeah, but presumably, uh, the good news stories would be big trade deals. I mean, we've done all these lots of trade deals, uh, Mark Garney, which is obviously replicating as an individual country what the EU had with the countries in question. And from everything from Albania to Japan, but no, none of the none of the, the the deals that would be transformative. You know, we haven't got the India deal, we haven't got China deal, we haven't got the Australia deal, we haven't got the U.S. deal. You know, why were these not as it as your boss likes to talk about oven ready? Um, well, we are moving on. I mean, we're we're, we're working on the U.S. deal, the uh, New Zealand, uh, the uh, with, uh, CPTPP, and uh, and Australia. Um, and the Japan deal was slightly better than the JIPA deal, which was done between Japan and, uh, and the European Union, and sort of slightly more tailored, tailored for us. So I think we are moving ahead with this. But at the end of the day, you know, we have, uh, I'm sure I think it's about 67% of our total trade is now covered by these, by these deals, which we've, we, we've but carried out. we want out. to grow the trade. Isn't that the point? We were going to grow the trade with these new uh, reinvigorated trading partners once we were outside the EU. Yes, and that's what we're doing. We're, 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 we're moving forward to do a trade deal, for example, with the US, which is one that's failed to be achieved. How quickly between... do you think, though? I mean, how quickly? It's a, it's a big deal. I mean, it's 14% of our total trade, and so we've got a lot of things to get well, through. But, let, but... Let, I just wanted to pick you up in a minute on that. But Stephanie Flans, you're shaking your head about the idea that we're going to do a quick turnaround American trade deal. But, but even if we did, imagine if we got a deal, a fantastic deal with the, with the US, a fantastic free trade deal, um, with the US tomorrow, uh, our economists looked at this and you would need at least four or five Americas to do a deal with in order to just replicate the kind of tr the trade that we might have potentially lost uh, from just from leaving single market. If you look at what we've just the, the straightforward cost to trade of making it more difficult to trade with our biggest trading partner, you need to find four Americas to do a really good free trade deal with. And unfortunately, if you look around the world, there is only one America. <laughs> There's only one economy so, that we could get that kind of benefit. So let's just quickly talk about uh, financial uh, services sector. We don't have, we've got a memorandum with the financial services, but we don't have a deal. Does that matter? I think on financial services, there's, we, we know, we knew uh, for a long time that it had been uh, left out of the detailed negotiations of the last, of the last couple of years and that there was going to be uh, quite a lot of movement, as Mark Garnier said. There's, there's, there's parts of financial services that we've already seen gone. And I think even if we did arrange, find some kind of arrangement with the EU on this, and they've, they've, they've shown no desire um, to make it easier for us yeah. to sustain our position, whether or not that's in their interest, they haven't shown any desire to do that. Um, we have seen quite a lot of uh, London's business and its sense of being a major global financial centre already kind of seeping away over the last few months. We had a, uh, there are polls suggesting that uh, only a third of financiers now think that the city is the but, world's uh, but, preeminent global but, hub. And but, it was but, let, but let me, but let me just put this to Emily Thornbury, a counterpoint which comes from uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, who say that the UK has overtaken India as the world's fourth most promising growth opportunity and foreign direct investment generally has always been an attractive destination. The FDI has actually held up. Well, 
let's see. Um, I mean, I think there are many advantages to for people investing in the UK. Of course, there are, and uh, and many people want to to live here, and and for every reason, you know. So, so it isn't just always you know kind of pounds and pence quite often. But I think in the end, when it comes to trade deals, as Stephanie has said, the question is. Is there enough trade around the world to make up for any losses that we may make in trade with the European mm. Union? And the second point is, at what cost? So you know, which countries are we prepared to make deals with and on what basis? Are we prepared to protect our agriculture, for example, if we want to do a deal with, uh, with America that has very different food production mm. standards? What are we going to do about protecting access to patient data for the National Health Service. What about data generally? There is a whole lot of questions um, when we're coming to making deals with other countries that have culturally uh, very different uh, approaches to these things and very different economies. Thank you all very much indeed. I've been